Okay. Well, welcome to the Spring 2024 SLO Talk Series put on by the California Outcome Assessment Coordinators Hub, or as we lovingly like to refer to ourselves, coaches. I am Amanda Tainter. I am the coaches president, and I'm joined by our founding director, Yarek Yanio, and Danny Pitaway. Do you want guys want to introduce yourselves? You'll be here. They'll be here helping us to moderate our chat. Good morning. Hello, Yadik Yanyo. I'm the founder of the Friday SLO Talk. Thank you very much, Amanda. I work at Santa Ana College School of Continuing Education as a faculty coordinator. Danny. And good morning, everyone. My name is Danny Pitaway. I'm a full-time faculty member and SLO coordinator at Coastline College, which is in Orange County, California. I don't see any other coaches here yet, but if they pop in, they'll be uh, helping us to moderate the chat as well. Um, as I just said, we'll monitor the chat and also have a Padlet available for any questions you might want to post anonymously or keep after the uh, SLO talk finishes. We'll put those links in the chat um, once we start. Today's presentation will be posted on the coach's website. We'll put that link on the chat as well. On the coach's website, you can find all of our previous presentations, the recordings, and the presentation material material and other useful resources. So with that, Yark, would you like to introduce our first speaker? Absolutely. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. It's a pleasure and an honor to have Dr. Sierra Abder Tasiupa-Api as our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Abder Tasiupa-Api serves as the instructional technologist in the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, for Teaching and Learning Excellence at Nevada State University. With her extensive experience in the realm of educational technology, she has been an influential figure in integrating artificial intelligence into higher education, facilitating workshops, and leading panel discussions on the topic. Her expertise is not limited to artificial intelligence. She has also been a prominent figure in the areas of scenario-based learning, project-based learning, and gamification. Her contributions to the field are well recognized at regional, national, and international levels through her dynamic presentations at various conferences. She is the esteemed co author of Gamification in Higher Education, a How to Instructional Guide, and the editor of the anticipated publication, Gamifying Your College Classroom Strategies to Foster Life Skills Across Disciplines. Please get ready to immerse yourself in a project-based learning escape room experience and discover the nuances of building. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Sierra Abair Tasiwupa Api. Welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for taking time out Friday to join us today. Um, I hope you come away with some exciting ideas, and I always enjoy hearing from folks about what they're doing with gamification. It's definitely a love of mine. And um, before we get started, I will apologize for not being on camera. I had eye surgery, and um, I'm very light sensitive right now, so I'm sitting here with a ball cap that's pulled down over my dark glasses. So <laughs> it's not, not a pretty sight, but you know, <clears throat> It works. So I will share my screen and we will get started. All right. Can everybody see my presentation? Yep. Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, welcome to the great project escape. I love this quote by Onan. He argues that the robot-proof model of higher education is not concerned with topping students off with high-octane facts. Rather, it refits their mental engines. I love that, refits their mental engines, calibrating them to a creative mindset and the mental elasticity to invent discover or otherwise produce something society deems valuable. Now you'll note that he wrote this five years before the invention of ChatGPT. So what I'd like to do is have everybody unmute themselves and let's discuss this a little bit. What 
about the advent of disruptive technology as generative AI has been referred to, can we expect in our classrooms? Do we want to robot proof our classrooms? If so, what does it even look like? So what are your thoughts? I'm going to suggest that uh, we should look at uh, AI as a dragon to be tamed, not a dragon to be cowered from. Ooh, that's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Could you ask the question again? I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm just in, in light of this quote about robot proofing higher education and the invention of generative AI since then, um, what do you think a robot proof classroom would look like? Is this something that we should even be thinking about? Or should we embrace a robot uh, classroom? I've heard AI compared to um, calculators. When that, when calculators first came out, mm -hmm. there was a lot of fear associated with them. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that with a robot. Mm-hmm. And yes. Chen, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, um, so I definitely think robots can, can provide really valuable insights into education. But um, instead of having them take over class classrooms, I would say um, I have some friends that are actually practicing using ChatGPT to generate um, valuable questions for their students. Um, but at the same time, he's the one that's actually teaching. So I definitely think um, using the like the analysis skills of the of the AIs would be really useful, but at the same time, uh, there really should be human components into it that um, really matters about how you deliver the education. And how might project-based learning either help us to robot-proof our classrooms or to help us embrace the robot in the classroom? Oh, God, Sarah, if I, if I may add to this, I, I think the answer to this question is right there in the quote. Produce something. Students are there to discover or otherwise produce something society deems valuable. I believe that's that's really the crux of our conversations here in Friday SLO Talks mm -hmm. is the focus on skill, competency, and relating what it is that students learn to their daily lives. They are all, we are all parts of uh, communities of our, uh, of, of, of uh, we, we live in certain contexts. And I believe that education with AI may help us be feeling productive and well-informed citizens, members of our communities. Exactly. That's th this importance on the, the creative mindset, you know, that's a growth mindset. And then mental elasticity. I, I think that is a wonderful image of what we need to instill in students. And there are ways that um, the, the robot in the classroom might actually help with this, especially when you're talking about problem-based learning or uh, project-based learning. Um, I put this quote, well, the quote's up there. You don't have to read this. Um, it's just for the folks who are not joining us today so that they have a little bit more if they're just looking at the presentation. But in considering project-based learning, it subscribes to the idea of engaged learners through authentic inquiry-based learning experiences. Project-based learning cultivates collaboration and includes hands-on activities with the end goal of producing a meaningful artifact, be it a project, be it a paper. There, the meaningful is the real important part, something that is gonna to contribute to society, something that they're gonna deem valuable. 
As part of the process, students, of course, can develop or augment technical competencies, very important these days, learn adapt adaptability because not every pathway is going to lead to a viable solution and that succeed or fail and try again um, is a very important component to prepare students for the future. They're also going to learn how to construct and reinforce knowledge while exercising problem solving skills. Additionally, problem-based learning assists in spanning that gap between student learning and college and then what they really need to know when they get out into the world and to become successful in whatever career that they choose. As problem-based learning pedagogy is an effective approach to developing students practical abilities and those other 21st century power skills that they really need to have in this day and age. So when adding gamification to project-based learning, studies have shown that it enhances students' learning experiences, increases student engagement, boosts their knowledge of, sub of the subject, and helps them to connect skill-based learning objectives to those core course objectives for the class. Powerful scenarios embedded in gamified project-based learning raises real-world questions that require actions, answers, or both, and challenges students to examine the obstacles from different perspectives. Look beneath that surface for unexpected connections and explore possible pathways that aren't obvious on first or even second glance. The game that most impacts students' knowledge gains and retention contains hurdles designed to draw the learner beyond their comfort zone, which is why I absolutely love escape rooms. It's my go-to for gamification. Because escape rooms contribute to student agency, and autonomy in their knowledge acquisition. It enhances their critical thinking and leadership skills. It also showcases students' understanding of the concepts, supports collaboration, and motivates students to apply learning in order to solve challenges presented in the simulated real world scenarios. So as we prepare our students, either for robot proof or robot inclusion, we definitely need to future proof our classes. Now, what do I mean by future proof? We need to teach our students for, and prepare them for jobs of the future, jobs that don't exist yet. How on earth can we do that? How do we future-proof them? And what kind of benefits do our students get in terms of teaching and learning by us future-proofing our classes? So once again, unmute yourself. Um, what do you think future-proof looks like in the classroom? And how can we really prepare students for jobs that don't exist? Mm -hmm. Anybody uh, want to wait in? Sierra, oh, again, I, I I think you're you're kind of like leading us into this because you you already spoke about project based learning, right? Mm -hmm. So as we go through instructional activities in our classrooms as students, we need critical thinking skills. We need problem solving skills. We need uh, we need to realize that we are dealing with reality. This is not anything that's hypothetical. Project-based learning to me embodies really the, the 
crux of education as it should be, right? Mm -hmm. Connection between theoretical knowledge that may be somewhere in our brains to in converting it, translating it into, into action, into actual solutions to, to, to problems. And I believe that, that in that process, we develop skills and competencies that will help us tackle problems we don't even know exist. Because mm -hmm. you're you're absolutely right. 2017 seems like it was so long ago, <laughs> <laughs> considering the changes that happened, right? I mean, after 2017, we had COVID, which made Zoom ubiquitous, and we mm -hmm. had Chat GPT, with which made access to 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 you know those those the 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 powerful uh, tool that 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 that's that's just became so so very popular. And uh, I, I believe that that again, you're you're already suggesting, you're telling us this is the way to go. So that would be my take on it. I think so. Um, probably and we, learning. Oh, go ahead. Oh, we had a couple of hands raised. Uh, Teal, did you want to unmute? Uh, yes, uh, I've been dealing with uh, new technology for for many many years with uh, mostly students who are in the BSN pipeline. They're already CNAs or they're EMTs and they wanna go into nursing or maybe counseling or social work. And so what I have found is give them tasks, assignments that incorporate the new technology. This might be AI. A few years ago, we were using different kinds of new statistical programs or new websites that were around that would help them make decisions. The key is to view all of these new technologies as possible tools. Now the jobs of the future may change. Existing jobs will transform, new jobs will emerge, but the goals, the purposes of those jobs are pretty similar. In business, it's how do you make a profit? In uh, healthcare, it's you know how do we diagnose and treat patients? And so we're looking at teaching our students how to utilize new tools, perhaps tools that don't yet exist, in order to solve problems and achieve goals that we are already quite familiar with. The changing job is merely a changing context in which we will use tools to satisfy those goals. Exactly. And, and getting students comfortable with whatever technologies that are available now is certainly going to help them in the future when they're confronted with new technologies and basically feeling like, oh, maybe I'm have starting from scratch here. But when they can draw on having worked with new technologies as they come along, then they had kind of hit a comfort zone to where they're more comfortable trying out something new instead of being afraid of it. I really liked your dragon analogy <laughs> that, that, yeah, we're going to tame the dragon, but we're not going to be afraid of it. And Irene, and so, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt go ahead. you. Um, and Irene also has her hand raised for a comment. Go ahead, Irene. Yes, thank you. Um, I am in the humanities, and I'm just going to throw a little bit to the left of what you're saying. Uh, but while using positively creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication, and that has to do with what um, was just said about this project-based learning needs critical thinking skills, problem-solving skills, but mm -hmm. also dealing with reality. And with students in the classroom today, dealing with the humanities, it is so much a challenge to get them to deal with reality, the reality of history, because history is very much a part of who we are today, but students are so involved in the new gadgets and the thinking about what's on their phone and the dealing with what happened in the past doesn't make a link with them. So this is a problem, a challenge, and there's um, hopefully some solution in this that you're presenting today about pro project-based learning, because again, project-based learning as you have been presenting, has specific things that they are dealing with and future jobs. But the future jobs is not involved here in the knowing of history. This is something that is much a part of the basics for all of us. 
So that's a question. It's a challenge. It's searching for solutions. Exactly. Well, there's a survey that just came out of um, managers and HR directors and executives from uh, all kinds of businesses across the United States. And 58% of them said that college graduates are unprepared for the workplace. They lack the skills, um, and this is a direct quote, um, they lack competencies in self-directed learning, empathy, oral and written communication, critical thinking, rely, uh, resilience, intercultural fluency, collaboration, creative problem solving, and taking the initiative. That is very enlightening. Um, and they also said that um, the students need to develop these meta skills, these four C's, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication, that they are key when it comes to identifying, analyzing, and solving problems. Then communicating and defending those solutions and establishing priorities and working with others. So with that in mind, um, our common book, our common read book that we've had for the past couple of years is called A Tale of Two Planets, Stories of Climate Change and Inequity in a Divided World. I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful book. I was trying to think of ways of devising novel interactions of combining problem-based learning or uh, project-based learning and escape rooms. So I started thinking about what if we were start a module with an escape room instead of ending it with it? Particularly in introductory courses, students may know very little or nothing about the subject area. And when it comes time for them to choose a topic on which to do a project, it can lead to a lot of frustration and feeling overwhelmed. So that kind of got me started down this road of this escape room that we're gonna play here in a minute. Um, so I designed it to have the scenario that kind of kicks off the unit of introducing um, climate change and um, the abundance of impacts that are mirrored subjects to what was risen up around, ugh, can't talk today, um, what was the themes of the different chapters in the common read book. So that students would have some connections between the books and project ideas. So we are going to be entering Dr. Olivia Marvel Newton's office. And you'll notice that there's a picture of Lake Mead and how we have the bathtub ring effect with the water going down so much. Her screen uh, shot is of Lake Mead in its heyday. And then she's got this poster on the wall where it talks about the drought conditions in Nevada and California. So you're welcome to read along with me. Um, here's our scenario. It's 2027. You're working with renowned scientist, Dr. Olivia Marvel Newton's team. You're rushing to develop and implement an environmental plan to save the American Southwest before climate change reaches the point of no return. Lake Mead is on the verge of Deadpool. Hoover Dam barely generates electricity. As a result, massive rolling blackouts plague the Las Val Vegas Valley and beyond into California. The states that the, the states that rely on the Colorado River, Lake Powell, and Lake Mead for water have implemented severe conservation measures. But the combination of prolonged extreme drought and the greenhouse effect continues to deplete the water supply. Globally, each year, with each passing year, it, it seeds the last as being the hottest on record. Although brilliant and driven, Dr. Marvel Newton is obsessed with security. She doesn't trust the cloud or 
computers for that matter. She stores all of her research plans and strategies in her head, but she does keep some parts of it in hard copy form and others uh, parts on an unnetworked laptop in her ultra secure home office. While right. making a final right. area survey for the plan, Dr. Marvel Newton's helicopter crashes. She survives, but lies in a hospital in a coma. Dedicated as ever, as the helicopter goes down, she heroically fires off an encrypted, I'm sorry, my dog is decided to get very vocal. Um, she, uh, uh, okay, she's encrypted it's in voice message on her phone. It says three minutes to add up the correct answers at G to open door. Seven minutes to type cryptic, find clues for letters. It's up to the team to decipher her message. Fortunately, you know what G stands for. Once the team assembles outside of Dr. Marvel Newton's office, you access G. And Amanda, could you put um, the link to G? It is, um, a trivia maker game that you play asynchronously. If you put that in the chat and you've got three minutes to go through with the, the questions and answers. Yeah, so the link is in the chat. It should be clickable. Let me know if you have any problems. All right. Oh, yes, I know. Remember what you're looking for are the yes. answers, the correct answers, the numbers and the correct answers. Once you've noted your answers, we're going to start a Nearpod game, and that's where you're going to input the door key code. Going to go just another minute. All right, Amanda, will you put the um, Nearpod link in the chat and try the, the one on the bottom. Um, and if that doesn't work, then then click on the one that's uh, nearpod.com slash student and enter this code right here. And it, it, it is case sensitive. So capital J-A-3-4-L. And I swapped them in the chat. So try the first link first. And if that doesn't work, oh. then the second link and then the code. Sorry about that. That's okay.
give it just a few more seconds. All right, we're going to get started. So it is time you have been to G, you have hopefully um, added up all of the correct answers and are ready to put it into the key code. So I'm launching it right now and you have 30 seconds. All right, your time is up. And uh, I'm not seeing any correct answers. So we're going to go to clues. All right, so your first one is spelled differently, Eunice has a measurement in her name. Remember, Dr. Marvel Newton is overly concerned with security. Keep this in mind. This won't be the most obvious answer. And the second clue is, Jason, what? And your third clue is, what is the correct year for Robert Anderson's electric vehicle? Has everybody added their numbers up again? All right, let's go to the door key code for your second attempt. And this time you've got 15 seconds to type it in. Ah, yes, I've got correct answers now. <laughs> yes, congratulations. You have managed to successfully crack the door key code, but it triggers a recording. I'm gonna play the recording right now. Let me know if you can't hear this. You have seven minutes to discover the clues hidden around the room and enter the cryptogram into this unnetworked laptop. Should you fail to correctly enter the cipher in the allotted time, the room will be flooded with gas and you will wake up in a maximum security prison cell. Your time begins now. All right, so you get into her office, you're looking around, you see a stack of books, and there is a map that's kind of sticking out of one of them. So you pull out the map and take a look at it. Notice there are lines drawn on the map that run from various parts of the eastern part of the United States out to the Colorado River and Lake Mead. Your first letter, well, one of your letters is going to come from this clue. Think about this map and what Dr. Marvel Newton has drawn on it. Then your next clue is on Dr. Marvel Newton's drawing board, there's a whole bunch of sketches and they appear to be early prototypes of an array, a solar panel array. And then you spot on a top of a filing cabinet, a pile of documents that 
every one of them pertains to California and climate change issues. And you'll notice that this is a NOAA rendition of San Francisco with the current ocean levels as they are now. There's also this NOAA prediction of what San Francisco's coastline is going to look like if the ocean levels keep rising from the melting polar ice caps. So we have depictions from NOAA about the rising ocean levels. We have the solar panel array with the early sketches. And we have the map that's got lines drawn on it from the East Coast out to Colorado River and Lake Mead. Three clues, three letters. They're all in caps. They are an ironic acronym and a word. It's not a word in English, but it is one that is coming into use in English. So your three letters make up an acronym and also a word. So we got the lines drawn on the map. We've got the solar panel array prototypes, and we've got the ocean levels rising. All right, so our warning said that we had seven minutes. These are the clues that you found. Take a minute to think about it. Play around with what those three letters are. That's the ironic acronym or a word. Let me know if you'd like me to go through the clues again. Uh, Sierra, just so I'm not missing the instructions, uh, are, is there a place to enter that word? Are we just trying to we're, come we're up with coming it? to that next. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> so I just wanted to give everybody time to sit there and play around with what letters they think it might be. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll give you another minute to think about it. Do you want me to go through the clues again? Yes, please. Okay. We have got the rising ocean levels that NOAA has predicted. We have got the prototypes of solar panels. And we have the lines drawn on the map. All right. Are you ready? Again, you have 30 seconds to enter your ironic acronym. That's also a word. It's all in caps.
I like it. <laughs> we have hot, we've got low, we got or <laughs> REI, <laughs> EPA. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, nobody got it right. So sorry. You have entered an invalid cipher or you ran out of time or both. <laughs> so remember, we're looking for one letter from each clue. And so the first clue was the map. And what has Dr. Marvel Newton drawn on the map? The second clue is all of the patent sketches on Dr. Marvel Newton's drawing board show early designs of what product? And your third hint, the two NOAA images show what will happen if what keeps rising. So do you want to unmute your mics and discuss it a little bit about what you might think having these additional hints? Well, the first one I think is diverting water to the Lake Mead from all the other water sources in the East. Yes, but the clue is what has Dr. Marvel Newton drawn on the map? L. He drew lines. Yes. Thanks. All right. So we have one letter L. So what's the next one? Solar panels. Yes. S. Mm -hmm. S. And the third one is ocean. 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 Okay. So what do you get with these three letters? L S O. Yes. Go ahead and enter your letters. You've got 15 seconds. Yeah, I'm seeing a bunch of SLOs. <laughs> All right. Well, well, for those that, that um, got SLO instead of LOS, <laughs> you guys are busted and you just woke up in jail. <laughs> and for those of you who did get it correct, SOL, <laughs> Congratulations, you just gotten out of the escape room. <laughs> so now you know why I said it's an ironic acronym as well as a word. All right, so <laughs> that said, I bet you're curious about how I had this set up is I set this up in Canvas. And of course, with students who are playing it, they're all on Canvas. So they would do it through the Canvas, not through Nearpod. But Nearpod works when you can't get everybody into a Canvas course. So this is using MasterPass to set it up. And finally got MasterPass working again. <laughs> so of course, the first page that the students would go through. This has your basic scenario information. It also has the recorded voice uh, message from her cell phone when she was crashing in the helicopter. And the clue, the, the G cryptic to go to, the link to it, to play the trivia maker game, to get the different numbers to add up for Actually, I'm going to put this into student view so you can see it from the student perspective. So after going through those things, then you click on the next button. And this is where you would enter 
the door key code. And I'm just going to type it in. And of course, the students wouldn't see this. This is going to be the students. And they would submit something. And I'm going to go through getting it wrong to show you how I've got it set up for the clues. So this tells them that they did not get it correct. Well, they go back. And click on the next button and get the first clue, which is about Eunice and the measurement that is not the obvious answer. And then their second clue is asking Jason what? And the third clue, what's the correct year for the electric vehicle? And then they would be given a second chance. And if you got it right on the first one, you would skip over these clues and literally go to the next question, which is going through the office and finding the clues for the ironic acronym. Put your life insurance in for the mayor. Sierra, we had a question oh. about how this is embedded into Canvas. Is this a near pod embedded within on a page in Canvas or or no. just the logistics of, of how this is done? This is Mastery Pass, which is one of the tools that's available to everybody in Canvas to set this up. I did the near pod because I couldn't put you guys into my Canvas instance. So Got it, thank you. Yeah. We're gonna type in the correct one this time. Oops, it helps by the right number. And there's an additional question in the chat is um, if you'd be willing to share this module or perhaps it's already in the Canvas Commons. Um, I haven't put it in the Canvas Commons, but I can. Thank you. So the students go through, they get it right on the second time. Then they get the into the office and they get the warning message that is the recording and also the instructions to click on the next button to start going through the clues in the office. And you'll notice that there is a time limit for the students in class, they had 20 minutes for going through this part of instead of seven. I set it up for seven for you guys, but they would have 20 minutes in which you've got, got the, the map with the lines drawn on it. You've got the solar panel array, and then you've got the pictures from NOAA showing what happens with the sea levels rising and then type in the acronym. So we'll do that, I think I'll get to the S this time. <clears throat> you can see going through the clues. I have to refresh it. I'm rushing through. Okay, well, it's not going to let me go. And while this is refreshing, um, we had a couple of just reminders, not really questions in the chat, but mm -hmm. just those of us that use Canvas, Mastery Pass needs to be activated by the Canvas administrator. So if you are using Canvas and are having access to this, just make sure, and uh, if you don't have access to Mastery Pass, reach out to your Canvas admin. Um, and then Kelly uh, just put in there that these are new quizzes that we're looking at and not classic yes. quizzes. And that also needs to be enabled by some Canvas admin. So that maybe is for those of us that use Canvas, why this might not be familiar. But you don't have to use the new quizzes with it. You can use classic quizzes. It works just as well with um, Mastery Pass. So you're not limited to having to use new quizzes with it, just to let you know. Great, thank you. We have gone, we've gone to new quizzes because um, uh, of our nursing program and the, the fact that the new quiz question types do mimic 
or are exactly matched to the new NCLEX that the students are gonna have to pass. So we have gone, we've turned on new quizzes for everybody at our institution. But so this goes through all of the clues that we went through with the, the Nearpod. And then the second attempt to take the exam. And once again, the points are halved for the retakes. But you don't have to have it be worth anything if you want. You can have it set up where the, the points don't count toward the final grade. go through it and they escape the room. So I'm gonna leave student view and show you how I have this set up. Go back to the module. So this is, this is a standard module in Canvas and you do have to put in all of the, the clues for the pathways um, as well as the assessment quizzes that lead through the exercise. So like I said, you start with what your basic scenario is. And then when the students get in, after they've gone to Trivia Maker and played the game there, this is set up. And with classic quizzes, it's the same thing. You're going to have the tab that's got details, and you've got the tab that's questions, and then the next tab over will be master pass if you have turned it on. And to turn it on for your individual class, if it's allowed that way at your institution, you go to settings, and there is a place to tell it to turn on master pass. That's for individual classes. But definitely contact your admin about it because it is a part of your Canvas instance. So what you do is you set up your placeholders to start with so that you get your pathways built. So that was all of that list of things in the module. And so you put your pathway in. So for the students who get it wrong on the first try, then that's where they're gonna get the series of clues and then be given their second attempt at entering the door code. For those who get it right, they get the open door, congratulations, you've gotten it. Now, now you have to figure out what the acronym is and the quiz for entering the letters and having the clues. You'll notice it's repeated up here because there's three pathways set up in Master Paths. I'm only using two. So in order to get it to function correctly, you just repeat it with the same for the top level. If you had it where you were having three different possibilities, um, like when I set up having the students do um, a PSA and they can either do a um, written uh, print version of the PSA or a radio spot or a TV spot, I have the three different pathways and all of the material that they need to know for how to design that. So for the print ads, it would be talking about font and font size and colors and you know images. So you would have all that information about that. Whereas if you're doing a TV spot, it would be how to set up um, the script, um, the walkthrough, the narratives, you know, where people are gonna be, so who's gonna do voiceover, that kind of stuff. And all of those pathways would all lead to the final project that would be turned in based on what their pathway was. And the rubrics would be geared toward their particular pathway. So Master Pass is really good for setting up some personalized learning experiences, as well as things like escape rooms. So then when you're actually building this is just putting in the, the quiz question, which in this case is um, what's the key to the, the 
uh, opening the door. And that's just a, a standard fill in the blank. And so, like I said, you have, you start it with just placeholders. You know what you're going to name the different things. So have that set up so you can get your master pass set. Then I'm going to go down to the one for the cryptogram and the master pass that are set up for it. And it'll take a second for it to load. So again, for the students who miss it on the first try, they will have the different clues and given a second attempt. For those who get it correctly, they'll instantly go to that congratulations piece. And I've got it set up uh, if the student doesn't get it on the second try, that um, they'll get the one that, that's the, your busted in jail. If they go to jail, do they have the opportunity to start again? That depends on, on what you want to do. Now, what I have this set up for, like I said, was for the start of the module. And the, the reason for that is um, I'm using the escape room, all of the clues and the pieces of the scenario is all leading to them figuring out potential subjects for their project. So all of the clues that were in the trivia maker game, um, the, all of the women scientists that were listed with Eunice Foote, all of them are women scientists who have contributed to some form of climate change. Um, Eunice is the one that came up with greenhouse effect. The, all of the clues of what they're seeing in Dr. Marvel Newton's office are potentials for um, projects. I'm going to go back to the presentation and pick it up from here. So these were all set up for Um, here's our, the, the various uh, learning objectives that went along with this escape room uh, in, in an environmental science class. Um, so, of course, when the students are doing their project, they're going to be searching the scientific literature for what has been done, what, what are possible areas of um, issues and solutions. They're, they're also going to be looking at the different um, issues, and that's what this escape room introduced them to with some of these environmental issues. Um, they're also, of course, one of the objectives is to actually do a project and then to be able to present that um, to a variety of audiences. So, of course, I already told you about the different women scientists. Then also information about the greenhouse gas effect. They got introduced to that. They got introduced to some of the climate change issues with um, potential projects on um, the rising water temperatures, the uh, melting of the polar ice caps, also, with the climate change, we've got the wildfires that we've seen in uh, California and in Nevada in recent years. Lake Mead has gone, this is um, actually uh, images taken from um, the space station showing Lake Mead 20 years ago and showing it now. We have the, the map that um, with the lines drawn on it as a potential of some types of projects. Thinking about all the flooding that's going on in the east with all of our drought conditions out here. What do you think 
would be projects that could come out of seeing this map with the lines drawn on it. Transferring water from those other rivers to the lake, maybe? Yes, yes. It's a, it's a project that I would love to see people implementing, but it's not something that, that they're necessarily thinking about. So this would be a great project for your students to think about. There's ways of, of tapping into that flooding conditions, stopping the flooding in the east and getting us the water out here that we really need. Then of course there's solar panels, which is always near and dear to all of our hearts out here. We're living in the, the blessing of the sunshine states. Desalination is um, potential, particularly with the melting polar ice caps and the rising ocean levels. So this game introduced them to a lot of different possibilities that they could then um, turn into their project. It's a little bit different way of, of looking at escape rooms. And then I will just wrap it up with, um, if you got any questions, I love hearing from you. So please email me. This is on the presentation. So don't remember, you don't have to remember my ridiculously long email address. <laughs> and I do have references from all of the different sources that I talked about, including here's the, the Tale of Two Planets. And this uh, from Rick's is the study um, that if you take it, look at it, it's a real short article, but it's very insightful for the, the things that employers are hoping to get in new employees and are not finding right now. And it's a great justification for talking to your students about these problem uh, project-based learning uh, and gamified ways of um, oh. thinking for the future. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for um, getting all of our minds working. I don't think I've had to think that hard in a long time to figure out that game. And, and it really challenges me. I, I teach in child development and to apply, okay, how can I do that? Because me as an instructor, I thought I'm having to think really hard. And someone up in the chat, you can put those um, into chat GPT, but the whole mm -hmm. process of having to think through the clues. So I thought that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and and an of interesting way of of introducing students to potential projects. Exactly, well, thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Danny to introduce our next speaker. All right, thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Sierra. So speaker number two, it is my pleasure to introduce Nicole Espinoza, the inaugural director of assessment at Nevada State University. <clears throat> Nicole has been a transformative figure at the university, playing a pivotal role in establishing new procedures for both program and institutional assessment. With an impressive 20-year tenure in higher education, she has found her passion and considers her current role as the perfect job, cherishing every opportunity to assist faculty in enhancing student outcomes. Today, Nicole will present a session titled Assessment Best Practices in the Tech Advanced Data Enhanced AI World. She will take us through the evolution of assessment practices over the past two decades, sharing the narrative of how Nevada State University has embarked on a journey to reset and refine their assessment strategies. In our ever-evolving technological landscape, her session will shed light on professional development strategies that faculty can employ to leverage AI, online sharing platforms, and Canvas. These tools are instrumental in revising and rejuvenating assessment methods making the processes more measurable, data-driven, and collaborative. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Espinoza as she guides us through the transformative journey of assessment practices in the context of our modern tech-advanced world. Uh, thank you so much, Danny. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. 
Um, Sierra and I work together and we have been working together on a pretty big project that's going on where we're working in establishing some uh, Canvas outcomes. So I don't know if anybody is working with some Canvas outcomes now, uh, but we're on the forefront of that. So we'll be talking about some of that Canvas outcomes work, but I did want to um, show a little bit of everything that's going on and where we're coming from. Uh, and this is a little bit about me and Let's talk about where we're going. And then I have a little bit of Padlet that I will, let me get my chat up. That I will put up a link. If you can go ahead and start doing that, we're gonna eventually talk about that. Hopefully we can get to the demo and we'll talk about that and learning outcomes. And I'll do a little AI work that we have been working on. That, that Padlet is just showing some learning outcomes. This is one that I did just this last week where we did learning outcomes with my faculty members. And we looked at learning outcomes and the good ones, the bad ones, and the horrible ones. And we looked at them and figured out how to fix them. And we used some AI sources to do that. So I'm hope I'm going to show you how to do that. And then we'll uh, do a little activity on that as well. So that should let, lead you to this Padlet, hopefully. If you would just kind of go into the Padlet, you should be able to click on it. If you haven't seen or done a Padlet, you just click on these little plus signs and then you just tell me what is wrong with these learning outcomes. So you just have to click on them. And by the way, this will communicate effectively in writing that as a math hello. So uh, you just click on them and just say, what do you think is wrong with it? Uh, he does not have to be perfect in any way. You don't have to give it to me in a perfect information. I'll let you keep on going with that one as I continue on. And then we'll get back to that. So as we're going on. So I just want to give you a little bit of background about Nevada State. I'm actually a pretty new at Nevada State. Most of mine, came, um, Nevada State is actually in Henderson, which is a suburb of Las Vegas. And I've lived in Henderson for quite a while. Um, but I, most of my experience has come from that big UNLV. So about 20 years of that came from UNLV. So I'm pretty relatively new at um, Nevada State. I worked as a part-time instructor. And then I have been at Nevada State for almost a year now and in this position as director of assessment. And I am the first director of assessment, even though um, it's been in um, a school for about 20 years. So you can imagine that it's had some um, growing pains of assessment. So, uh, but let's talk a little bit of kind of background of what's happening with Nevada and what's happening kind of around the country. So if you kind of go back to the basics of accreditation and assessment, this is how the map looks of assessment. A lot of the country is in HLC. Of course, California, where we're getting a lot of you guys are in the WS. Um, CUC, I use a lot of your, um, I infiltrate California information all the time. We're part of what's called the Northwest Accreditation um, or Northwest CCU, which is, includes all of the Northwest, even though we're considered really Southwest area. And it's kind of funny, the Southwest area, which is Arizona, is part of HLC. I don't know how that works. Um, so, and then um, as you can see, it's kind of all pulled up in there. We're all separated. But I wanted to show you one big thing that you hopefully most of you might have seen in this last week in higher education is that there's a big set on the creditors and how they want to, if anybody has seen this, and I do have the link of this about how there is going to be a big push on the from administration and from higher level national about setting benchmarks for student outcomes. And I knew it was coming because we actually got a little ding from uh, Nevada State about making sure that our assessment measurements are good. Um, so 
Um, it's coming down the row and I think it's coming down the row anyways. So I think it's a good time to do this kind of reset and revise and renew along the way. And it's a good that we have all of these great kind of learning and educational platforms and tech experiences, which is really neat. Um, um, trying to make things measurable for our students and, and um, using these best practices. Uh, for our Northwest accreditation, I always bring up this little portion that's just part of their standards uh, because accreditation, of course, everybody looks at accreditation and they're like, oh, I just have to appease accreditors. But I believe in the one thing and that one thing is students. And that's the reason why I'm in my position is for the students. And I happen to like the students and I happen to like working with faculty. So I, even though I know my job is because, and I get paid because of accreditation, but I know that my job is always to improve students and to make sure that I'm focusing on equity. I'm making sure I'm fixing those achievement gaps. I'm improving those student learning outcomes. I'm helping improving teaching and learning strategies. And I'm hopefully making some impactful strategies. And that's my goal when I'm coming into this, into this um, position and into this um, space here as kind of this Nevada state. Assessment loop. And I put a question mark there because I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Most of us all are in assessment. We have established learning goals. We provide learning opportunities. Most of us do assessments just fine, but we don't use the results. So we have an issue with assessments because we know that the, the definition is the gathering and analyzing and interpreting evidence. But our big issue is we have a stop here. For some reason, we never use the results and we stop and we don't close that loop. And that's our biggest issue with assessment is we never get to the, the, to the point of closing the loop. And that's, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, we don't get to the use the results. We see the results and we never get around to the results. And so my goal here at Nevada State is to make sure we're using the results and we're trying to, to make some information and some data informed decisions. We're not to that point yet, but we're getting to the point where we're actually getting some really good data to hopefully get some um, data grooving so we can start making some informed decisions um, to maybe establish some learning goals and making sure those strategic goals are being met and we can make some informed decisions really based upon monies and where monies are going and it's coming. So let's let me just talk a little bit about Nevada State so we can um, so you can kind of see where we're coming from. We are part of the new majority uh, first generation 33%. Um, adults with college credit, it's about 17%, 35 plus. In fact, uh, we are 18, 19 population and I think is only 17%. So it's pretty insane. Um, students of color is over 50, 51%. And in fact, um, Caucasian white is about 17%. So it's very, very low. We are, um, the Caucasian white is minority immigrants, uh, immigrants and um, maneuvering poverty is a 28% Pell Grant recipient. So we're considered the new majority. Uh, we're the only teaching four-year university in all of Nevada. We don't have many universities anyways. We have two R1 institutes in all of Nevada. And then we're the only teaching four-year university in Nevada. We just became a university. We just we were in Nevada State College, four year college, but we were Nevada State College. Um, but we became a university because we just added three graduate programs. So now we do have some graduate programs. They're mostly educational programs. We have a MSN. We have a a, a mental health a, a school psychology degree, and we have a speech language pathology degree. So they're all educational based. We have a heavy dual enrollment. So that's where a lot of our ones are coming from. So heavy dual enrollment. So those are part-time students, but we still do have about 4,000 students on ground. 
And then we're still about 20 years old. So we're still considered new. So we're right during the age of assessment. So you can see some of that young assessment work. So we were coming in early on. So you can see that that young assessment work was coming in. So we came in where we knew there's assessment coming in. So it's not like it doesn't exist here, but it wasn't like very pronounced and very organized to the point of where a lot of assessment has been resetting. And we got, um, this was our last fulfillment report is there was, we were substantially in compliance, just needed an improvement on the only thing we did really good because everybody loves a teaching university is about our program assessment. So that's the reason why I exist in my space. So kind of a reset pause and to get information from you uh, in a chat, you don't have to speak out um, in a chat. In what ways would you establish assessment practices at a college or if you've had any similar experiences to one I described and had any of you had similar experiences on either that new majority or any of like the, um, the experiences that I said. So right now, again, assessment's kind of not there, that at least that organized assessment. And you can speak up if you want to speak up, or you can uh, put it in the chat, please. Just so we can get some going. So a little reset pause while I get water. A shared understanding of why we assess. Yeah, I think that's super important. And that's where I definitely had a, a start. And I had to really get my entire university and all the programs in for sure. And I had to make it sound like it wasn't me that's dictating it. It was really me that was there for them and for me, for the students. Using rubrics. Rubrics is a huge thing here. I'm actually starting to do some rubric development, uh, not just in Canvas, but in a whole bunch of other things. Qualitative assessment. My All my people just want to do quantitative, quantitative. I'm like, bring it back. Let's do some indirect assessment. So it's really been fun for them because I, 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 I've been telling them to do some focus groups and telling for my programs, at least, and telling them do some some really qualitative assessment work. So and they're they're thinking outside the box now, which is kind of exciting, too. We definitely don't assess. And I think right now it's hard for their faculty members to understand that. I think they think it's just work, but I'm trying to, as you can see, I have a pretty dynamic personality. So I think that's one of the reasons why they, they're like, okay, this person can wrap their arms around this teaching school that really doesn't have the systematic program assessment. They were doing assessment, but they didn't have the systematic, so maybe she can get them through. Um, I think that that was very helpful. You know, you have to keep that positive attitude um, to kind of loop them in. And in fact, sometimes when I start seeing it waver on that email, I'm like, uh, can I just meet with you? I just, I had that waver on that email just this last week. And I said, can I just meet with you? And that, that one 15 minute um, meeting turned into like the best meeting for this entire week. It like domino effect, like five different faculty members. So that, that like touch to touch and we're small enough that we can do it. Thankfully, you know, that little, that little, um, that little extra incentive touch was nice. Yeah. Try to keep that positive. Um, I, I have an educational background, which means that it makes it a little bit easier for me to keep that positive, you know, and to, to I, I think they now at least know that I have the experience to keep it. And I teach like sciences and I teach pre-nursing and our school is actually set up, I didn't say this, but our school is set up where we have education, nursing and 
like LSAB, which is um, liberal arts sciences and nursing. So I'm almost like all three. So I, I, I have a biology undergrad, I have education masters and I teach pre-nursing, you know, so I almost have like a, like a, a little dip in all of them. So it, it made it nice that I could almost get to know them all. So they know, I know a little bit of them all. So in a, I know a little bit about AACN essentials. And I know a little bit about how education standards work. And of course I know how about like science and, and the core curriculum, which was nice. So that's very helpful. Yes, and then we're going to talk about that and Canvas outcomes right now. So, so some of those things um, where it's showing in here and just bringing some of the information out, comprehensive resource allocation, planning, building. So I'm going to talk about some of those aspects as we're going through and talking about it. So I'm just showing this map just real quick. It's going to look kind of discombobulated. I'm a, a, a unit of one. And I think eventually they're gonna recognize I do so much that my unit of one will probably um, expand. Um, but this is unit one, this is kind of my assessment areas. Um, and as you involve the group and you know, we're pretty small now, so it's okay. It's not like we're UNLV, which has over close to 30,000. So uh, this, is, this is where my involvement in group. So I have like program assessment, institutional assessment, and then I still do professional development, which I'm gonna talk about. And of course I do accreditation. We haven't done, we're thankfully not on this cycle right now. So we have accreditation and those are involving the groups. I always say that these are my inputs. So this is what I'm inputting to them. So I'm trying to help them with forms. I'm trying to give them feedback on, a, on direct assessments. I'm helping them with campus outcomes. I'm helping them with training and resources. And this is kind of what I expect as their outputs. And then hopefully their outputs, um, which includes like accreditation and increasement of assessment of best practices, ELO alignment. So some of those little things, hopefully we'll start seeing and improving student outcomes. And as we start seeing those kind of student outcomes are pulling and improving, then we can start aligning. And hopefully that's what we want to do is start aligning our kind of fiscal and budgets to figure out enrollment and figuring out new programs and start recognizing that. And we've, we've figured that out already because we've created those three gra graduate programs to go with our uh, kind of our education. So kind of, of our practice and then getting into some of the activities that I did, I created these forms to align the shared documents first. And these are just cl classic assessment best practices, a course map, a program assessment plan, but I knew I had to switch it up a little bit for our faculty members who are who don't want to just meet all the time, who had to be on a in be in person. So we're kind of a not a weird university, but we don't use Google. We only use Microsoft. And for some reason, everybody still uses Google here. And I'm like, I don't know why we still use Google. That means they're using their personal um, stuff. So I started use, trying to use all our Microsoft products or Outlook products. So I'm going to show you what I did is create this share document. And this is just a really quick demo. And this is a shared Excel document that I created for every uh, program. And this is just to kind of get them going. And I have a template. You're welcome to email me. Uh, once I give them this, it, you, this will actually link to the template and then that should link to me. And then you know, it'll give you the access to the template. So this is a, a like an assessment planning template where I have like the chemistry. I got rid of all the names, but you can see that on the speech pathology, I'll show you just real quick the, the ones even with the names. So this is speech pathology. So you can see where the names are. So let's go back to kind of the clear one. So I give them like this assessment planning template and it's an Excel template. So kind of think of it as like Google Sheets. Um, we're not a Google school, so I'm trying to keep it in house. So they're not going outside of the school um, information and it's all linked here. So it'll actually link to the templates, which is our Dropbox. It links to the program learning outcomes. These, when you look at these, they type in here, and when they type in there, they go automatically onto here. 
So when I, if I were to uh, add to it, choo -choo -choo. this is PLO7. It should automatically, if, unless they messed up, see this is PLO7. So it automatically links all the way across each one of the other sheets. So I made it so that all they have to do is type here and then it will align itself all the way across even here. So then this is PLO7. So it'll allow it to like pull down here for this is PLO7. So it, it just kept on all the way through here so they can keep up with the assessment planning. And this is a shared document. So they could, they could um, not be in the same office if they didn't want to. It was like their way to kind of keep it um, so they could still work on items. I gave them, the, these are essentially the three um, activities they had to do this year. But then I also give them like a course learning document so they can start working on uh, aligning their course learning outcomes. I gave them a course review template if they wanted to work on course review template, a faculty review one if they wanted to work on that, a current status one. Uh, there's also some information about like where to go and clicking on like their enrollment data. And then, and then this is just the, how it all works and kind of comes all together. So I made this like little template that a whole play like allows them to kind of keep organized. Uh, it just allows just a way to kind of organize themselves. Uh, most of them are using this, which is helpful. Uh, some of them did not, of course, but most of them are using it and they're uh, keeping it organized. They had to eventually put it back onto those other sheets though, for like more formal, these sheets right here, they had to eventually put them onto those sheets more formal to turn it into me but at least it was almost like a clear copy and paste, which made it nicer. So they copied and pasted it directly onto each one of those sheets, um, which made it pretty neat. Um, so it's linked all the way through and each one, of, it was it was pretty easy to, to make too. Once I had a template, I just kind of copied it over and just added names all the way through. So a little bit extra work, but it made it super nice and kind of, um, um, equaled out all the way throughout for my programs. I wanted to make it so that it was, that they had the information kind of sparingly for them. So that's just one way to work on it. So that's one of my demos on that. Now let's talk about our ELOs or ILOs. This is where I can talk about, start working on and talking about how we work on Canvas outcomes and what we're doing with Canvas outcomes. We are using um, like a core curriculum and our core curriculum was established in the summer of 2021. And that summer of 2021, it was all faculty. I was not here. I was here as a part-time instructor, but I was not here as a full-time director of assessment. Um, so those uh, were established and there's 12 of them. They're pretty much ACU value rubrics um, established with those ACU rubrics. Um, prior to fall 2023, which is when I came on, no outcomes assessment planning was ever completed at all. And I was like, that's not going to happen. I need to, we need to actually have some outcomes, ELO outcome assessments um, was, was established. So they started in summer 2021. We did have um, assignments done. So they had a system of assignments, two ELOs for most of our cores. We do have most of those all done. We just didn't have any of those outcomes assessments. So we started doing that. So I created um, at UNLV, uh, I have extensive work on Canvas outcomes. And actually at UNLV, they started working on Canvas outcomes because of me. Um, so I have extensive work on Canvas outcomes. So I know how to do Canvas outcomes at the admin level. So I started working on Canvas outcomes and I started working here. I created all the ELOs in the Canvas outcomes and I added it in there. And then I just started piloting. And then the first thing I'm gonna pilot is our first year seminars, of course, cause that's gonna be our baseline. And I looked at first year seminars. I also looked at some of the easier pilots, um, which is ones that are taught by like 
um, people that I uh, that are pretty good with online that know how to do rubrics. So I did women's studies, which is the one that you see right there. I did women's studies, um, which I knew that instructor and she teaches both of those. So I piloted theirs. I did my math 120 this this year. Um, and both of the all of those are first level and we're piloting in those and we're going to be adding on about four more in the next year for these ELOs. But I don't think that's where we need to stop because those Canvas outcomes really, if you have not seen the Canvas outcomes, and I'll demo a few of those in just a second, Canvas outcomes aren't just about ELOs. Canvas outcomes can really do in individual courses, program learning outcomes. You can put them into um, nursing standards, AACN standards. Um, this one shows intact standards, which is, uh, which is for... Uh, education standards, you can put them, these Canvas outcomes in anything. So I'm about to show you, uh, um, uh, it's a, a mock quiz, but I'll show you a quiz that, that I put together uh, that has some outcomes uh, embedded in there. So it's pretty neat that you can start actually adding these quizzes in there. And with, I'm, if anybody actually is using Canvas, uh, they are actually adding a new rubric uh, development. It's coming up very quickly. And I think it's an end of April. I'm very excited for it. We're, they're going to do embedding Canvas outcomes, which I'm super excited about. And that's where you, it'll like embed these canvas outcomes which this is going to shift my world so uh but and i'll show you that in just a second too where these outcomes are happening so i decided to do let let the world know about canvas outcomes so sierra and i created a canvas outcome series and this canvas outcome series i believe in pd especially tech pd to be short i think it's Tech PD, you don't go longer than 30 minutes. So I make them 30 minutes, 30 minutes only. More than 30 minutes, they're gone. So I do click, 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 done. And there's, I do stay beyond and Sierra and I will stay as long as they need. And Sierra and I will do extra time if they need extra time to work on anything. But we make sure that they're manageable and that the activities are manageable. Everything is kind of prepped for them. Um, so they're 30 minute series and that's it. We also want to make sure that we, we do it synchronous because some people are just better at synchronous. So we do a 30 minute synchronous, we record it, and then we we also deposit it into a, a Canvas account, and then we allow it to go asynchronous. And then they had the, um, the faculty member would have to like complete an activity separately. So we do it asynchronous, 30 minutes, it should still complete, they should be able to still complete in 30 minutes as well. So let me show you both of these and kind of how they look. Hold on, my presentation just decided it did not wanna work anymore. All right, so this is kind of how the series looks like. And my series, I, I try to make it very short, sweet. Faculty do not want a whole bunch of things to go through. So I make, make sure that they have a little bit of resources in there, um, a little bit of information in there, always some resources, always some clicks available in there. And here's the video. The video itself, this one would happen to be like 57 minutes long because it was because uh, we just went longer, lots of questions at the end. So and there's a little bit of worksheet and then they turn in. So every single one is always the same for um, the very first one. And this is one of those new quizzes again. So if you don't have new quizzes started up, this is the you can add outcomes to old quizzes, but you can only add outcomes to new quiz old quizzes 
as the whole quiz. Um, but in new quizzes, you can add outcomes to individual quiz um, questions, which is a which is awesome. So I would suggest to if you're going to start using these outcomes, to to you make sure you're using new quizzes. So if you're looking. Your sound just went, Nicole. I'm wondering if your Bluetooth disconnected. Just letting you know. Nope, it still looks like it's not picking up on your mic. <laughs> well, I know with your technology, you'll be able to troubleshoot. We'll give you a second. Not yet. I'm I'm reading your lips. <laughs> Sierra suggested unplugging your headset, but I think it was I a it now. one. Oh, perfect. There you are. Thank <laughs> you. Yep. Sorry about that. I don't know why I had it all charged too. It just it was done. It was done for today. Sorry about that. All right. So and Nicole, there is a question in uh, that we have. Do you want me to go ahead and ask it? I I apologize for breaking sure, no, screen. Okay. So do, does Nevada State have an outcome? statement on their assessments in Canvas explaining why outcomes data is being collected? Um, no, not yet. And we we are kind of um, piloting right now anyways. So it's, it's um, is as a pilot, but we do have it all over ELOs. So we do actually show it on the essential learning outcomes, but I know that's coming. Um, it's going full, full force in fall of 24. So in that case, it's going to go full force in fall 24 when we have like, like then it'll be massive Our for all our first year seminars and all our math 120 is. So right now we have math, we only have a few sections that are doing it. And then in that case, the faculty member is just telling them. So we're not secretive, but we're we're just telling the the few sections that are telling them are just telling them in there, but we will be telling them when they're when we go full force on it. But that was a good question. Because you should be telling them. I've been telling my students and it's been excited. So let's just talk to you about like how this uh this uh outcomes works. So in this in this um quiz, you can actually put it on and this is the full quiz. You can put it on the full quiz. In this case, I just put the standard, which is the ACN standard. This is an essential standard of, um, of nursing, demonstrate compassionate care. So it's under domain two, subcompetency, and it's one through four. And it's saying that this whole quiz is demonstrate compassionate care. So that whole quiz is demonstrate compassionate care. When you go into a quiz, though, you can have one question. And if you do an edit on the question and on the question itself, you can have a question aligned to its own outcomes. So in this case, we just had this one. I, I just made up a lab skills uh, outcome and the lab skills outcome. You can have that lab skills outcome assess um, to that outcome which is which is um really neat that you can do them separately so you can have this one align to just a question and then the whole quiz align to uh, a, a major outcome which is which is a which is a neat concept and you can only do that in new quizzes so that can only be done in new quizzes um when it comes to rubrics, rubrics are a whole different ball game. And I don't even want to go over rubrics too much because they're shifting a little bit. But I do want to talk, just talk about a little bit about if you ever do want to start talking PD with faculty members. Um, PD with faculty members, it's really important to uh, have them play a little bit. And so I give each faculty member a uh, training module. And so I put their names on it and I give each faculty their own little um, 
uh, assignment. So in this case, it's their own women's um, studies 101 assignment. So you can say it's Michelle's and Monique. So Michelle did not do the assignment yet. So her the assignment was to create a rubric and the rubric was supposed to be a 50 point rubric. And so you'll see on Monique's, which she did complete the rubric, um, there's going to be some uh, additional ones there. So you'll see that. So I put it up there for them to do and I, ask them if they're going to be coming and Michelle just hasn't done it yet. But here you can see Monique's is done. So she put in 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. And she put in those information. She was supposed to, part of the assignment to do this was to make this one worth points. So I had them put this in not worth points and then this one in worth points which you can do. And I showed them how to do that in this, in the rubrics. And, and then she completed that assignment. And then that's all they had to do for that assignment. So the reason why I'm not really talking too much about rubrics is those rubrics are completely shifting in about a month. So there it's, it's like moot at this point. So there's going to be really cool information that's coming out on Canvas on those rubrics. Um, but this is a great way to have it. It really is not that hard to do too, because you just have to duplicate. And when you duplicate, you just change the name every time. So it's, it's not even, you think, you, oh, that's a lot of work. You just have one up here. It, it was mine actually, where you just have up here and you just duplicate. And every single time you duplicate, then you just change the name. Uh, and then it makes it go by pretty quickly. Um, and then usually you have to change the rubric name too. So it didn't take me that long to do it. And it goes by pretty quickly for all that. So let's see if this PowerPoint is going to work. Yeah. Maybe it was everything that was going on. It just didn't want to do it all. The headphone and the. At least I didn't lose you. It's, so, it's feeling the Friday blues too. I know. Apparently <laughs> so. It was like my, my computer's like, I don't want to do this, this, and this. Like, no, I'm not going to do any of that. You've had to, you've worked too hard, Nicole. I'm just going to take it off. So um, it's just not about programs though. So I wanted to mention that I believe assessment should be really kind of open. So um, I'm one of those people that I make sure that it's open to everybody. So I've actually created it to make sure that it's good for adjunct. I have co-curricular things. I have something specifically for student affairs now. I'm one person. We're trying to get something going on. And of course, we were going to try to get student affairs going too. But I've created some stuff for some with a, a, a institutional effectiveness. So I'll show you a little bit about that, what we're doing. Um, that one's coming up in April. Uh, so we're, we're kind of like creating a whole thing. We really just want to make sure it's going and going kind of outward as much as possible. So uh, this is one of the ones. This is one of our tableaus that we've done. No, I didn't do this one. That's institutional effectiveness. I work really closely with them, institutional effectiveness, and they created a, a nice little program evaluation. This one is not like forward facing to the regular uh, population, but we have access to it. They told me that this is, ever since I started, this is the most that they've actually seen hits on these these tableaus because I have like, I'm like literally knocking it out every single time. So I make sure that every time a faculty member asks something, I'll be like, hey, why don't you look at this data table? Or why don't you look at this data? Or so I'm always making them make some data-driven decisions because it's very important for assessment to make them those data-driven decisions. So that being said, I think it's important to make sure you give them the opportunities to, to know how to do these things. Some of these data sheets are just massive and they just don't understand how to go through them. So I always make sure I do a walkthrough. Um, this is just a quick walkthrough of just me walking through it. 
I use Screencast-O-Matic, just a Screen Pal, just walking through it. I do it with music. Screen Pal is free and it has music in the background. I don't even do anything else other than that and just allow it to, to go through it. And it, they do a really good job on that there. So that's just a quick one. And here is where we're going to talk about this one. Hopefully it's still going. Hopefully they didn't make that one go away. So let's talk about these learning outcomes. So these learning outcomes that you guys did a long time ago now, these learning outcomes, let's see some of them. Um, which says participate in networking. This actually participate in networking. All these, by the way, I'm not, I mean, I worked there for 20 years, so I shouldn't be mean, um, but those all came from UNLV's website. So, um, so I can't be too mean, but these all, I was like, I'm going to copy them from somewhere. Um, but that actually came from public health. Um, so they, vague there's no criteria like what how do you do effectively understand we know understand can't be measured um most of these are like uh most of these you can't have multiple verbs uh how how do you apply um applying what like this is where's the criteria here um programming language like this is like these are these are how these learning outcomes are um, built is how we originally were having issues in our in our school. And so we really had to talk about how to make these new changes in our faculty. So I came up with a little activity for them, which is what I'm going to just show you just a quick one on AI, and some of you might have seen this. Um, but for AI, um, they do they have done a pretty good job with assessment. If you want to go to AI, the, any of the AI sources too, I like to use chat GTP, but if you want to go to any of the AI sources, that's the one I use. I'm going to bring that over too. We could probably do both. Um, you for AI, you always want to choose. Sometimes it's not the best at choosing the most measurable ones. So you want to make sure that you're clear to him. To him, I'm going to make him a him. Um, always, they're not always the best at making complete sense. They don't always do the best at giving more information. Sometimes I was trying to do one to tell him to get more succinct and he wasn't getting more succinct. So sometimes even resetting it is helpful. So they, you sometimes have to tell them to not tell, do words and I'm going to give you some prompts. And these are helpful. And in fact, I, um, I, I'm giving you this and I, you can just copy and paste it directly off of the PowerPoint. And it's a little bit helpful to do that. So let me find that. Find that again. Let me show you a little bit about AI here. Let me just show you what I mean. In the chat, though, if you would just give me a, um, just give me a course of some kind, any course, I don't care. Oh, English 101 is no fun. Do it. Infant toddler development. Infant toddler development. So I'm just putting I bet this was directly off of I just copied and pasted it from the from the PowerPoint. So infant toddler development. And it says, write five to six course learning outcomes for a course that is called infant toddler development. Format the course outcomes as numbered list. Each outcome should be one sentence. Begin each outcome by using a strong measurable verb. Use only one verb per outcome. Don't use the words understand, understanding, or appreciate. Let's see. Now 
Now, if you look at it, it does identify, analyze, evaluate, demonstrate, apply, synthesize. Those are actually all pretty good verbs, not too bad. They're pretty high level too. They're not, they're not too low level. Um, sometimes people don't like demonstrate, but it really depends on what is beyond the criteria. Um, I'm not too good about toddler development. So beyond that, how does it look? Yeah. And then sometimes you can add, let's see, you can add leveling to the to this to to outcome six. So leveling is like basic and advanced. So now I just added leveling to that one. And now I'm like saying, oh, I'm a new instructor. I'm just adding stuff. I just put it on this extra side because it's it's easier for me than typing because sometimes I type or it says, I'm a new instructor. Can you give me a detailed syllabus of 16 weeks? So this is a 16 week syllabus, by the way. I'll I'll scroll back, by the way. It, it takes a while. It says, I'm a new instructor. Can you give me a detailed syllabus for this course that details over 16 weeks with an ending portfolio assignment? And then it gives you a 16-week infant toddler development course culminating portfolio assignment. So it gives you the course description, course objectives, not saying that these are perfect by any means, don't copy and paste it completely, but it allows you to do some information off of this. And then maybe, and this is what I showed my instructors and they were like, one, one instructor was like, that is so clutch. And I, he was young, so I'm guessing that's cool. And I just said, give me a rubric on that portfolio. Certainly, here's a rubric for the final portfolio assignment. Remember, you can copy any of those. You can print any of those and copy them, any of them too. Um, and I did tell them that it's not always perfect. Some of these, some of these are don't make sense. I mean, you really have to look at them and really vet them. Um, especially if you don't know the material very well, you have to vet all the way through it. Um, so it, it will also do formative and summative assessments for outcomes. You can do any sorted items. So when I show the faculty this, they were like mind blown. So I think that just showing these, these little extra tools, they just love that kind of um, information. You can even see anatomy, course outcomes, genetic analysis, cultural diversity in healthcare is the one I did before. They just, they just love that you can do these little extra supportive things. They, they have a cognitive load that is just massive. They're, especially for a teaching university, they do four by fours. It's just really hard for them to have that extra um, just need a little extra time. And it's important for them to, ha to have that extra help. I use the learning outcomes a lot, um, just because sometimes um, I just need a little help. Uh, just sometimes that tweak of a learning outcome. Um, and it just helps me with one or two words. Oftentimes, I, that's all I need um, is one or two words. I'm usually pretty good about learning outcomes, though. Um, to fix it. So this does have some information about how to expand it. There's also another one. You can add a course learning outcome, like to change it. So rephrase that or expand on a learning outcome. So you can expand another learning outcome. And this is a good way to link and expand on the learning outcome too. I also use a, quite a bit of the collaborative learning um, documents, like using PD and shared documents. So here's another one that I use in order to do that. So um, I use the audience behavior, the ABCD method to show them how to use these. So we did um, um, that same learning outcome there to revise that learning outcome, to make it more student friendly, to make sure that they 
they have it and we um, we can sh show them with the blooms taxonomy table. We can say, hey, higher level blooms or lower level blooms. So it makes it really helpful because you don't have to like click on this to go see blooms or help me with the blooms because the AI will be able to help you too, which is nice. So that being said, kind of to end it all up, um, that's all the sort of kind of uses that I've been trying to kind of infiltrate um, because I am a techie person anyways, um, trying to reset, renew, revive and um, revise assessment over here. We're still in kind of our learning phases here, but our goal is to try to, right now we all had, we are to the point where we are making, we have created all measurable program learning outcomes. We're, all, we're created all the um, assessment plans. So next year we'll be um, implementing all those um, plans and then we'll start hopefully start seeing some of those um, goals and those quantitative and qualitative measurements where I'm gonna start doing some indirect um, PD. Uh, we'll hopefully get some of those, like you were saying before, qualitative methods. I think it's great to get some of those qualitative methods in there. And assessment doesn't always have to be quant. Let's get some qualitative in there and then look some, and hopefully we can get some of those continuous improvement outlooks too, and, and see if we can get some great information on there. And then that's it. That's all I have. Thank you, Nicole. We had one last question in the chat. Um, share the templates for the Excel workbook. And I believe you said email you for those, correct? Yeah, it's okay. actually linked into here. So if you just get the PowerPoint that will be in there, when you go to here and I'll put it in there, maybe I'll put it on the very last slide too. But when you click on it, it'll click to me and then you'll have to, it'll just activate it. And it'll say, will you, do you get this person access? And then I'll just say, yes, it'll make it easier. Great, thank you. And just as a reminder, we'll have all of the presenter materials posted on the coaches um, website shortly. So we appreciate that. Uh, any closing questions? We have a couple minutes left. That was just fantastic. Um, thank you to both you and Sierra for, for coming and spending your time with us. I have, as always, a plethora of notes and now my Friday is gonna be full of what do I wanna do next on my campus, so. Um, any additional questions that people have in the, the chat? No? Okay, and thank you for the reminder, Yarek. Put the um, link to the coach's um, blog, and there you can, again, find the recordings and the presenter materials. So I think with that, we will say happy Friday. And for those of you like my campus that get next week a spring break, happy start of your spring break. And if you've already had it, uh, I'm really sorry <laughs> that you don't get to look forward to it. Um, so thank you very much. And we'll see you guys um, on April. Oh, Yarek and Danny, the, the date for our next SLO talk, I believe it's April 20 something. We're taking a couple of weeks break, right? <laughs> Should have written that down. They're both frantically looking it up right now for the next SLO talk. We'll be sending out a reminder. That's right, yes. we, it we is sometime in April. <laughs> That's right. It is. It's it's April 12th. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I don't want to. You know how it is. You know, when you're yes. on the spot. So I don't want to miss it. Yes, it's April 12th. We are taking a break because of the spring break. And uh, uh, we are we are going to come back on the April 12th, infusing, infusing creative thinking in higher education and uh, other topics. So it's going to be another exciting day. Thank you so much, Amanda. All right. So everybody have a great rest of your day and we'll see you back in April. Right on. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.